Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alan Murabayashi broadcasting live from New York City, the home of Photo Shelter. You are listening to I Love Photography Live, episode 47 already. Uh, you might be watching us on youtube.com slash photoshelter, or you might have downloaded the podcast by going to iTunes and searching for I Love Photography, whatever the case is. We're happy to have you with us. As some of you know, uh, I'm from Hawaii, and yet in a very strange turn of events, our guest today uh, has just moved to Hawaii less than a week ago, and I'm stuck here in sub-freezing temperatures in New York, which seem like they're just never going to end. But let me say hello to uh, Logan Mock Bunting. Logan, how are you doing over there? Hi, Alan. I mean, don't feel too bad. It's 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 kind of chilly today. I mean, it's it's around like 72. I'm I'm actually wearing long sleeves. I don't know if you can tell, but it's it's kind of rough here too. So I mean, I'm I'm trying I'm trying to feel for you. That you know, by Hawaii standards, that is pretty cold. So I, I know what you mean. It's all relative. <laughs> well, Logan, you. Uh, had a bunch of photos that showed up on Wired um, in the raw file, which is their their section for photography, and I had randomly come across it. I think either I was on Wired or it came across in my Facebook feed. Um, and the photos are not your standard underwater photos. They're they're about a sport called free diving, um, where people hold their breaths and try to dive as deep as possible without the aid of uh, scuba gear or whatnot. I'm I'm a certified scuba diver. I've always been fascinated by this, but I can only hold my breath for about 15 seconds. Can Can you tell us how you got into this and 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 the challenges of the sport itself? Because you are a free diver. That's correct. I'm I'm nowhere. I want to be very honest and upfront. I'm nowhere near the level that these these folks are at all. Um, but I really in, enjoy the sport and enjoy um, being in the water and underwater. To get to your question, the way I originally came into the sport was um, similar to what you what you said. I was uh, very involved in in um, surfing. Uh oh, I lost you. We're gone. Are you there? Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just showing some gone. photos here. Apologies. Uh, I was uh, I was involved in um, surfing, and my brother and I would go on surf trips, and we found it cheaper to uh, spear our own fish and cook that on a campfire than go out to restaurants. We were kind of dirt bagging the, the surf lifestyle, traveling around in Costa Rica and Latin America. Um, and like you said, we, we thought we were pretty hot because we could hold our breaths for 15 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, we, uh, we're from a small town in North Carolina, and one of our friends um, read online about a certification course for free diving. And we kind of thought it was silly because how do you get certified to hold your breath longer? Like that that just sort of, if somebody says they're going to teach you how to breathe better, my first reaction was kind of to giggle. I just, I didn't know. Um, but when they came back, they were absolutely schooling us. They were diving at least twice as deep as we were and at least twice as long as we were. And we thought, wow, there, there really is something to this. Um, and we all started sort of gravitating to towards this disciplined and uh, and and taught way of freediving. Um, there are a couple different schools out there, and I can provide you with links and uh, information. Because one of the one of the things I still, after doing this for years, I still actually go to these classes because I absolutely love seeing people come in being able to hold their breath for 15, 30 seconds, and by the end of two or three hours, usually people can hold their breath for two, three minutes. Um, it really is a teachable skill that everyone has the potential to get better at. So at what point did you si decide that, that you want to start photographing as well as just holding your breath? Well, that's also an interesting story that I'll try to keep briefer than my last statement. I, I really struggled with taking photos uh, underwater because one of the reasons I love photography is you can do it anywhere and I'm a freelancer and I love the fact that like one morning I could be taking photos in a surgery uh, and then the next day be doing aerials. I love that photography is this common thread through all these sort of adventures. But it also, for me, it got sort of tiresome having a camera all the time and so for a long time the water was the only place I did not photograph. I actually sort of held back from getting into surf photography or dive photography because I enjoyed actually being more present in life and not worrying about exposure and composition and, <laughs> and uh, you know, focus and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I actually 
tried to tried to stay away from photography underwater for quite a while, um, but it was it it was just too beautiful. Um, it was just too surreal. It was too it was too great, and uh, I started to sort of combine um, slowly and gradually started doing stuff underwater. I guess probably four years ago, um, maybe. Uh, Maybe 2006, 2007. So I guess I'm exaggerating. Maybe maybe eight or nine years ago, um, but it was something that I approached really slowly. Um, you know, if you make mistakes underwater, that that can be a really big problem, either for you or your gear. So I really encourage people if they do want to get into underwater photography, it's something that you take a very slow, learned, pragmatic, safe approach to. You, you uh, mentioned in the article that you use, uh, I think, the Ewell Marine bags as well as hard housing cases. Mm -hmm. can, can you talk about kind of general equipment and some of the challenges of shooting underwater? Sure. Um, I mean, the, the, there's two big challenges to underwater. One is that camera equipment does not work well when exposed to water. And two, you, you know, um, you can't... You can't really control what you're doing. If I'm if I'm shooting on land and I see a good angle, I can just stop. I can plant my feet. Um, in the water, you're always going to be moving a little bit, whether it's because of current or momentum, um, or trying to keep up with your subjects. It's just it's it's not it's a very different medium. As far as technically, uh, I am glad that you brought up the underwater bag. Um, I shot with uh, a used underwater bag. I actually bought it from Bob Crosland down in Florida. <laughs> um, I, I shot with that for probably the first two or three years um, because it was a, a cheaper way, a cheaper, cheaper and a simpler way to get started. Um, again, I, I, there's a lot going on when you're shooting underwater, and I think if you're really concerned with this big housing that's in front of your face and trying to deal with these things, you're not going to be conscious of safety aspects and what's going along, going around uh, alongside you. So uh, I, I started with a, a used underwater bag that was very limiting, and because it was limiting, it made me really have to work and figure out what was going on. Um, so it was it was something that I encourage people to uh, to. You don't have to have the most expensive equipment to start something. You take what you have and what you can afford and then really, really work with that. Um, as, as I got better and as I realized that it was something I did want to invest more time and energy in, I did invest more money in gear. Um, one of the real downsides to underwater housings is that each housing you get is specifically made for that camera. And so if the camera model changes, the housing changes. So you have to invest a huge amount of money, uh, upwards of two to five thousand dollars in each housing for each camera. So if you have a three thousand dollar camera, and then you have a five thousand dollar housing, obviously this ad that adds up really quick. You don't switch cameras sort of haphazardly. So it's something you really want to take a planned approach to. Um, for the for the images that you shot of free diving, I mean, I've I've tried to shoot underwater before, and it's you know, with scuba gear or snorkel, and it's just a disaster. So I, I can only imagine when you're holding your breath, even if you're trained, how difficult that is. My question in regards to the photos that were unwired, which uh, were of a free diving contest, how did you sort of gain the trust of this, of the contest promoters and of the people that you're you're shooting? I mean, this is a very, it's a very niche sport, and as you mentioned, it's a very, it can be a very dangerous sport. People have died doing free diving. So to go to the first part of that, um, I think part of the reason that I was able to, to cover this is that um, just straight up, these are my friends. Um, I approached this as a free diver first and a photographer second. Um, I, I, I am involved in the sport. I do love the sport. I'm, I'm involved with... Uh, uh, with the events, I'm friends with these these uh, uh, athletes, and when I went to my first uh, competition, it was to be with a friend of mine who was actually attempting a world record, um, and I I ended up um, quite accidentally, honestly, staying in the same location as most of the athletes, and that was a real blessing because I got to hang out with them. 
I wasn't just another media guy. I wasn't a guy with a camera who was swooping in to take something from them and then push it out as another sort of commodity or another product to meet a deadline. I was a friend. I was a fellow freediver who was staying with them and who was enjoying the experience with them. Um, I, I do, I freedive when I take the photos and part of that is maybe a little sort of existential. I hope that it really sort of carries across the, the feeling and the vision of doing, of, of being underwater and, and holding your breath. But I also do it because I think that you have to sort of stay true to the process and to what the freedivers are doing. Um, and I think that sincerity, uh, you can't sort of fake that or convince people of that. Yeah, if you if you are there and you spend the time and you genuinely care, um, people are much more likely to open up to you, and uh, and I would say that's sort of how I got in with that crowd. Um, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah, de definitely. I mean, I, I I think sort of blending in is definitely part of what photojournalists do. Um, so I, I totally hear you on that. The the Wired article uh, is titled The Insanely Dangerous, Weirdly Meditative Sport of Free Diving. Uh, you expressed a little bit of um, concern about the title being a, a bit link baitish. Uh, tell us your, your feelings about this. Yeah, this is sort of a, I mean, this is a, this is a tough line and a, uh, an interesting uh, sort of, you know, it's a state of the industry and, and I do understand. My concern with it was I do not consider freediving insane or weird in the slightest. Um, there is no doubt that it has, it is not the safest sport. Um, a good friend of mine actually died last year at this event. Um, he was the first person to die in an official freediving uh, competition and it was shocking and horrible and it's really been a huge blow to the community. Um, it's, 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 it's really, I don't, I don't even really know how to talk about it. Um, but at the same time, it's a very, very, very beautiful sport that a lot of people really enjoy. Um, and my intent with the photos was to sort of do honor and do um, to show the beauty and freedom and athleticism. I mean, the, the people that are doing this, there are literally some people that are doing things that no other human on earth can do. Um, William Trubridge uh, is the gentleman who holds two of the uh, freediving records, and he can go deeper than, uh, uh, I believe his record is 121 meters, so almost 400 feet underwater, and he's literally one of the only humans who can do that. Um, and there's an amazing aspect of physiological response that happens with these things, um, and there's an amazing amount of sort of surreal beauty that happens during these events. And it was, it was interesting to see how my intent was to, again, show sort of the beauty and, and interesting aspects of freediving in, in a both scientific bend and an artistic way to show, um, you know, what the human body can do and then also hopefully have it in an engaging, aesthetically pleasing way. And the headlines, like a lot of headlines online these days, sort of seem to be much more of a sensationalistic bend. And I think it's sort of a, a tough line. Uh, I mean, one of the things I've really had to deal with as a photographer, but also as a freelance photographer, is that a lot of times if you have intent with your imagery, once it's out in the public sphere, um, that intent doesn't matter so much. Um, it's this, this thing that you have put time and effort into is now a commodity. It is literally a physical thing that can be bought and sold. It can be, it can be changed. It can be taken out of context. Um, and not to get too philosophical, but I think it's a, very interesting, it's a very interesting place where we're at. I don't think the headline was false. Um, I, it's, it wasn't incorrect. Uh, it was just a bit more sensational than I would have liked yet that's not really my call. I, I, I don't really know how to explain it, and I'm, I'm still working through it. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think it was malicious, so it's kind of hard to, to pass a judgment on it. Um, but it's just interesting when, as, as, uh, as a photographer, as an artist, as a creative, you put time and energy trying to create something, 
and then once it's out of your hands, it just sort of goes. And it's it's interesting to see how that happens. I guess everybody in the in the supply chain, if you will, has a different set of concerns and goals. So you you're trying to stay very true to the the subject uh, and produce great work. And then once it's in the the hands of the media, they have to bring eyeballs to it. And and often the the two goals are competing with one another. Definitely. And I don't think I don't think it's unique to photography. It's definitely not unique to this case. But I I mean, off in in having this discussion, I remember. I can't remember who it was, but there have been several bands who have complained that politicians have used their music right. in, as the, you know, that so, and, and I know there's artists who, who feel like imagery or whatever they've created, uh, graphic artists or painters or whatever that have, have created, uh, you know, visuals that have been, I don't want to say usurped, but have been used or uh, changed in different ways. So it's certainly not a new conundrum or, again, I don't even know if it's a problem necessarily, a new issue. But it was it was interesting to see how that happened in this case. How did how did Wired find you for this? Is this something that you submitted to them, or did they just come across it? Um, I send out email promos with things. Um, so uh, I do email promos and I do uh, postcard marketing. Uh, you know those sort of the, the things that you often mention in the uh, in the photo shelter. Uh, how to be a better better practices guide. <laughs> And um, so they're on my list uh, of people that I touch base with occasionally. And w before I go off to uh, events or even when I go off to different geographic areas, I send out notices saying, hey, I'm doing these sort of things. Uh, you know, is anyone interested? And when they first approached me, it was actually about a previous project that I had done six months ago. Um, but... Uh, I said, you know, I actually have this this newer work. Would you be interested in this as well? Um, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, no, that's. I mean, it's nice to hear that that our educational guides are working for you. There you go. I, I do. Like I, I pay attention, even though you make me enter my email every single time. You send me an email about it, <laughs> and I have to give you my email to get the guide every time. I still do that. I still do that for y'all. I still want to know what, what you're thinking, and it, it is helpful. Hey, Logan, tell everyone what your website is and, and your Instagram. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, my website is loganmb.com, and my Instagram handle is logan underscore mb. Uh, and I, I, I really enjoy – I've been having a really good time with Instagram lately. It's, uh, it's allowed me to put a lot of things out there um, that I normally maybe wouldn't reveal or wouldn't give up. So I do encourage you to follow. It's been fun. I'm a recent convert, and I really enjoy it. Well, the photos are beautiful. Uh, the links to, to his website and to the Wired piece will be on our uh, blog at blog.photoshelter.com. But, Logan, super jealous that you're out in Hawaii right now. Um, but thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. And please, next time you come out, let me know, man. For sure, for sure. Talk to you later. Take care. Thank you. That is Logan Mog Bunting joining us from Hawaii. Amazing. A uh, great uh, guest. We haven't had a guest in a while. I think we're going to bring on more guests. I'd love to talk about photography with uh, the people that are actually doing it. As usual, you know, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. One of, uh, one of the things that we've talked about in the past is Peter Lick. And Peter Lick, if you don't know, is kind of like the Thomas Kincaid of photography. Thomas Kincaid was an uh, American painter who had a bunch of uh, galleries in suburban malls around the place and everybody bought his stuff. He was never really considered a good uh, artist. He was considered uh, a great marketer and made a lot of money doing that. And Peter is sort of the photographic equivalent. I think it's fair to say nobody that I know in the industry actually knows the guy. The New York Times published a piece on Peter this past week uh, kind of documenting how he's allegedly sold uh, $500 million worth of prints. Uh, but then also bringing up the point that the images have no resale value. And this is something that we talked about in the past because I wrote a piece about how the guy's a masterful marketer, even if he's not a good photographer. Um, I guess there's something something to be learned about that. It, but it is strange to me, you know, he's got a pretty uh, fervent following. And when when we publish pieces that kind of, put him in a negative light for his photography, people come out of the woodwork and say, hey man, why are you, why are you dissing Peter Lick? He's great, you know? His, his images aren't great. <laughs> I don't have a problem telling you that. 
you know, there are a lot of great nature photographers who do a lot better work. There are very few nature photographers who are as successful as business people. So kudos to Peter for that. But you know, there is no resale uh, market for his stuff. Uh, he's a masterful marketer. It's an interesting article. Interesting article. There's stuff to, to be learned from that. Uh, more controversy in the World Press Photo Contest. Uh, the winners of that were announced a few weeks ago. Um, and there was controversy last week uh, because uh, some 20% of the penultimate round was rejected for manipulation, over manipulation of photos. That kind of brouhaha went around and, you know, we wrote articles about it on the Photo Shelter blog. A lot of different pundits uh, wrote articles about it. Uh, World Press Photo and NPPA uh, released a joint statement saying that they would have a symposium in the fall to talk about manip manipulation because it was so widespread and because there was such a misunderstanding. And now, a new article from Shutterbug magazine says that uh, one of the winners um, staged a lot of stuff. It is uh, the mayor of the Belgian town of Charleroi who's complaining about Giovanni Troilo's uh, first prize for contemporary issues. And the photo essay is called The Dark Heart of Europe. And the photos and the captions paint this town of Charleroi uh, as this very, very weird and twisted land. And the mayor took exception to that, as any good mayor should for PR purposes. But he said, you know, a lot of the photos were staged. Um, and it, it, it just makes you really think about the state of contests. I mean, contests always have their problems because when there's prestige or money involved, people do weird things. Um, but it's challenging because I think that, that ethics in photojournalism can be compromised in a lot of ways, but there's also a lot of just interpretation in, in you know, how to write a caption. Uh, is English even your first language? Is nuance lost uh, as a result of that? I think we're going to be hearing a lot about World Press Photo. Uh, they seem to be kind of a lightning rod, not necessarily deservedly so, because I think they do a lot of good things. It's one of it's one of the the better contests that are out there. Certainly for photojournalism, one of the top. Um, but it's unfortunate that th they seem to be plagued by year after year. Somebody says there's something wrong with one of the winners. We've been talking about the weather. I mean, we always talk about the weather, but New York has had an unusually cold winter. The coldest winter, I think they said in 17 or 18 years. Um, it's just cold. I, I personally can't remember it being this cold since I've been in New York and I've been here for 20 years. Um, but here are photos by Getty photographer Spencer Platt, aerial photos and he's flying over the river. This, in this case, I'm looking at a photo of the Hudson River, an aerial, and there's ice on the <laughs> entire river. And you just can't believe that this is New York because New York historically is a pretty temperate place. The average high for February should be something in the upper 30s. Uh, and yet I think the high today was something like 25 degrees. And it's very rare to see ice on the river, but we're seeing ice on the river all the time. I'm seeing some really cool uh, hyperlapses. Katrine Eisman from SVA, notable Photoshop educator, has been posting a bunch on her ferry ride. Uh, and it's just weird to see, but Spencer has some great, great cold images. All of these images, all of the links will be available on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com a little bit later after the broadcast. Check that out. Over in the New York Times Magazine, the newly redesigned New York Times Magazine, a piece called Why Not Us Women? And it's about Sergeant Mado Dagbinza of the Congolese Army. She was one of, I think they said, uh, 50 women uh, out of 150,000 soldiers in the Congolese Army. Amazing. She had a photo journal that she sold to a reporter for whatever reason the uh, re reporter being michael christopher brown 
it's a really interesting piece because he 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 has these photos and he interviewed her uh, before she was killed in an ambush uh, in 2014. She's a very, very pretty girl, and she she acknowledges that in the piece. She says, I, I know I'm attractive. I, I get hit on, but the, the most important thing to me is serving the country. Um, and it's interesting to see this set of imagery uh, that show you not only sort of army life, but her at you know a beauty salon just being like a normal person, going out and then holding a gun. Really interesting piece. The the photos are a part of the story. Um, I think they enhance the story, but the story in it of itself is is really really fascinating. Uh, so check that out over on the New York Times. Sarah, who uh, Sarah's alternating the weeks uh, for I Love Photography. That's why you get stuck with me. Um, but she found this interesting piece on the Huffington Post. And it's a set of images by the photographer Mihaela Norak, who is from Romania, quit her job, traveled around the world, and then did a essay called The Beauty Atlas, or The Atlas of Beauty. And she tried to find women in all of these different countries that she was traveling to, um, to show that beauty knows no boundaries of race and socioeconomic level, et cetera. The photos are quite nice. The women in the photos are all stunning. And I wish Sarah was here to discuss this with me because if I have a problem with this particular essay, it's that she went out and she found attractive people. And so when in talking about, you know, this Atlas of Beauty, she wasn't trying to do kind of a, like a dove campaign where it's real women, women of different sizes. All of these women are very attractive, very thin and young. And so in that sense, if the if the notion is that you can find beautiful women anywhere, young, thin, beautiful women, I, I think we kind of knew that already. That doesn't really challenge the notion of beauty, not that that was necessarily her point. Um, but it's interesting, but I, I, I had mixed feelings as a result of of the essay. I might be missing the point who knows? Check out the photos and let me know what you think. One of the friends of Photo Shelter, photographer Jordy Wood, uh, is shooting for the Fader magazine, which is like a, it's kind of a hip magazine. Lifestyle, music, all that kind of stuff. And apparently denim is back. Not that denim ever really goes out of style, but denim is back with a force this spring. Jordy uh, shot these images for the Fader magazine. And they're just really nice portraits, kind of natural light looking, um, with a little bit of tone on them in a bunch of different settings. Cool images, check them out. Denim is back, get some denim. Get a, get a denim shirt with a denim blazer with denim jeans please wear that and take some photos and throw them on instagram <laughs> over on medium medium is this uh, site where you can publish stuff it was created by one of the twitter founders i don't really completely understand how it works but i guess there's like sub brands existing within medium this is from q point and it is the story of how helmet newton the famous fashion photographer photographed David Lee Roth and Van Halen, mostly at the behest of uh, David Lee Roth uh, without the approval of the Van Halen brothers. Um, and apparently Eddie was really pissed at this. Uh, but it just shows you, if you know Van Halen from the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, those guys really didn't get along, which is why David Lee Roth was they got Sammy Hagar, and then Sammy Hagar was kicked out of the band, and they brought back David Lee Roth, and then they broke up. You know, it's all this, all this drama, but a pretty interesting story uh, of this internal turmoil that they had in the band, and how David Lee Roth approached Helmet and said, "Hey, I want you to take a photo." He showed up where Helmet was staying uh, in in all leather, and uh, Helmet Lang said, "You're you're my new favorite blonde." Uh, so some interesting photos here. 
Here's the band back in the 80s with the big metal hair and helmet with his, his film camera. Really kind of a neat story. Uh, and two photos were released from the shoot. So I assume that there are more photos of this, but only two photos were released. One of Eddie Van Halen and one of David Lee Roth. Um, neither of which were used for the album cover, which was the initial point of the photo shoot. Ah, well, this link is no longer there, so we can't talk about it. I don't know what happened. But it was an article about how Instagram upped the ante during the awards season. The Oscars, the Grammys, they were all using and hiring photographers for their Instagram feeds. Mark Seliger did a whole photo booth at the, uh, I think, the Vanity Fair after party. I, I will say he did not use a camera phone to take the images. He had a whole studio with studio lighting with a high resolution camera, and those images were moved very, very quickly from his camera onto the Instagram account. Not that there's anything wrong with that. We've often said that Instagram is not a photo app it's a distribution platform and so people can post whatever they want I, I will say i do have respect for people that take really nice photos with their camera phones and we know people like ben lowey have been out there um shooting photojournalism uh with the phones and landon norman shooting fashion with the with the phones um but that wasn't how they used them but i think all of these award shows are realizing the power uh, and reach of instagram and so they're hiring photographers to try to, to shoot for them in near real time. It's really, really interesting how that's happening. Here's a really crazy book. Tiananmen Square, back in the 80s when all of that stuff went down, there was a photographer named uh, Xu Yang. And he's released a book called Tiananmen Square Negatives. Um, and if you know anything about the Chinese, they really clamp down on telling the history of Tiananmen Square. There's a lot of people uh, who are living, young people in China, who, who, for whom Tiananmen Square is kind of an afterthought. It, it really didn't even exist for them, uh, in part because it's been censored by the Chinese government. Here comes this photographer, Xu Yang, and he's releasing a book, which some people are kind of scared that he's actually doing this for his own safety. Um, but it's really interesting because what he published in the book are actually negatives. He didn't print the positive, he print the negative. And you can see them by going into your phone and changing the settings so that it inverts the colors. So it's a really, really interesting look. So here we're looking at one of the negatives um, outside of the Imperial Palace. And it, it's uh, ghost-like. Uh, the caption here says there's something impenetrable about the raw images with their muted colors and the ghostly x-ray-like silhouettes of protesters. And I absolutely, absolutely agree with this. I haven't really seen a book that published the negative image and then the technology now allows us to, to use our phone to see the positive. It's really, really kind of an interesting art piece as well as a piece of photojournalistic history. So check that out. I might, I might have to get that book. I really like that. Uh, the Chicago photographer Sandro Miller, he's uh, done a lot of advertising work. Um, he did that, that uh, viral series with uh, John Malkovich last year where Malkovich recreated a bunch of different uh, historical famous photos, uh, which a lot of people got a chuckle at. He was also a Nikon photographer, and he did a promo video showing off the video capabilities for one of the Nikon cameras. He got together um, with uh, an advertising copywriter named Brandon Crockett who proposed a project to get former inmates, have Sandro take a photo, a portrait of them, and juxtapose poetry written by those inmates and put them together in a book. Sandro was immediately hooked and the images are stunning, and the juxtaposition with the photography, uh, with the poetry, is awesome. And I just have to say, I like how the photography can be used really for a social good. And there's something about 
The interesting thing for me about this is the photography doesn't only serve the audience. It's not only telling the message of these reformed former incarcerated inmates. A good picture can uplift the subject. We talked about Kosuke Okahara's project um, in Japan, taking photos of cutters, uh, teenage girls who cut themselves um, and suicide attempts and all of this stuff and how the books that he was creating was in part for them so that they could see how other people saw them and he was passing these books around the world to get people to write comments to the girls and then he was going to present them back to the girls because the photos and the comments were for them as much as they were to raise awareness of the problem and similarly I think this pro this project with with uh, Sandra Miller and Brandon Crockett does the same thing for these people people that might have been down on their luck or who might have done something stupid when they were younger uh, and are now seeing themselves published in a book with a poem that they wrote it just gives me the warm and fuzzy with photography juxtapose art and culture magazine never heard of them before but pretty interesting set of illustration erotica photography design etc cetera, etc cetera. an art and culture magazine as their tagline says and on this uh, particular article there is a set of images called preservation by the photographer Blake Little and Blake Little many many years ago was doing a photo shoot and he had a guy dip his hand in a jar of honey and even though that wasn't the point of the photo shoot he found that there was something very surreal about the hand in the honey it looked like he the, the hand was caught in amber so over the past two years he's been putting an ad up on craigslist and just saying this is for an art project show up and when these uh, actors show up he tells them what he wants to do he wants to pour gallons of honey on them and take a photo uh, in many cases the subjects are nude or partially nude uh, and then he takes a photo now you know there's been a trend of putting food on people you know we saw the Polish photographer whose name is escaping me now doing the whole milk thing and then when that became popular you see other photographers trying to emulate the you know with the chalk or the powder dust and X Y and Z and some of them are more successful than others and I have to admit I was a little skeptical of this project because you know why are you wasting all this honey to dump it on people but when I'm looking at the photos everything that he says about it looks like they're trapped in amber is completely true there's a very very weird visual effect because of the color of the honey and the viscosity of the honey here's an 18 year old kid covered in honey from the back it looks really weird the way that the honey kind of blends in with everything and when there's streaks of honey kind of flying off of the people which isn't the case in all of the photos it makes a very very it looks like they're melting it looks like they're wax candles and they're melting so I went from skeptical to being kind of uh, a lover of the images I mean I don't know how much more honey he needs to waste I think he's proven his point I think he's got some really really great images um, so Blake little you did it you did it we always like to end on a fun or a humorous note Sarah found this one I don't know if you know the magazine kinfolk kinfolk is uh it's a lifestyle magazine and i know that we overuse the word hipster but it's kind of a hipster lifestyle magazine you know it's the kind of magazine where you'd see the word artisanal it's the kind of magazine you might read if if you uh have a local mustard sommelier there's great stuff in there but you know it, it it's this sort of genre of uh, of magazine on tumblr there is a tumblr called the conspiracy and what they've done is they found different instagram accounts that have featured the kinfolk magazine in at least one of the photos and then they created these funny little diptychs well they're quads quad tip 
I don't know what you call them. Well, what's a what's a diptych with four images? Anyway, there's a grid of four images for each Instagrammer, where the visual similarities and the style of photography are all the same. So in this top row, it's uh, Kinfolk Magazine in the upper left quadrant, then a latte with the little leaf in the upper right quadrant. And then an overhead shot of their sub uh, of the photographer's feet in the lower right qu quadrant, and then a wrapped package in uh, brown butcher paper with um, string. It's just a <laughs> very very funny set of images, kind of showing the cliches uh, that exist in a lot of Instagram, and then exist in sort of this subculture of kinfolk people. People who want to kind of stylize their life like this uh, magazine Kinfolk. So very, very funny set of images. I highly encourage you to check out the conspiracy.tumblr.com along with all of the images and links that we've talked to you today. Once again, those links will be on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. Next week, Sarah Jacobs returns. I'm even thinking maybe we'll have another guest. I really love talking to uh, the guests like we did today with uh, Logan Mock Bunting. So we hope you can join us again. Hopefully the weather will be warm. I can guarantee you we'll have a lot of photos to look at and a lot of good photo news to talk about. So for I Love Photography Live in Photo Shelter, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye.